My name is Jerry Cornwell. I'm one of the um, advisory board members for the Off the Beaten Track uh, program. And um, I'm here tonight to talk about uh, the Rio Grande Southern Dolores modules that were done by the MLM group in the Toronto area, which I've been a member for 40 plus years. So how did this all begin? <clears throat> in 1984, Harold and Virginia Midwood attended the first Mid-Atlantic Narrow Gauge Group module meet at the Howard County Fairgrounds in Maryland. So with Harold's encouragement, um, persistence, um, arguments, <laughs> uh, in 1985, some more members of the MLM group from Toronto attended the second module meet and boy, did it rain. So Howard County Fairgrounds is basically exactly what they says it is. It's a fairground. So this is a, this is a shed that's used for showing off cattle and horses and pigs and things like that. So it's pretty basic dirt floor and uh, pretty much open sides and um, a very, very leaky roof. So we retreated two guys with modules with desperately grabbing plastic bags and ripping them open and putting them over top of the modules to protect them from the rain and people with umbrellas and inside it was it, it was all quite a hoot so uh, in spite of all that we had a great time and we learned a lot about modules and within a few months the boys at in Toronto were hard at work building two four foot o and three modules with a generic narrow gauge theme in Al Collins's workshop uh, I should point out that several of the people who were involved in this exercise uh, are on the program tonight. So here you can see uh, this photograph was taken in May of 1986. We're on our way to the module meet. Um, and uh, some of the guys who were involved in building this uh, from the left, Al Collins, Paul Brunet, some of you may not be familiar with, he's a long-term uh, member of our group, was also involved in, uh, in the, this program, Her the late Harold Midwood, Keith Stamper, and myself. And you can see in the foreground here, in a somewhat terrible picture because of the shadow, but um, this is a two four-foot module, so an eight-foot section. Um, very uh, basic uh, uh, two by two uh, legs with plywood gussets. Um, we had a shelf on the bottom for putting stuff on. And uh, here's the module. We had a, a profiled edge. Uh, it was made uh, probably way more solid than much heavier than it needed to be, but uh, it did the job. So the first module, simple track plan, passing siding and a stub siding. We had a small creek, so that we had an excuse for a timber bridge. Uh, it featured a small station, which was donated by Al Collins and a water tank built by Keith Stamper and Viv Reynolds. It was built to MANGG module standards. It was DC with PFM SS2, because remember, of course, this was pre-DCC. Pre and this has been reborn. It exists, it exists today. Um, one of our members, uh, Ted Goodwin, has incorporated this into his home layout. And here's a better picture showing some of the module. Uh, we're trying to go back in the in the dark ages and finding uh, these images. Of course, these were all slides, um, and uh, uh, trying to get our hands on them are sometimes a little bit of a complication. But uh, as you can see here, there's the uh, there's the base of the water tank. The top of the water tank, the water tank crew uh, fell a little bit behind, so we didn't uh, actually have it ready for the first show we had of that. Uh, but we did have some ground cover down, and we had uh, a couple of locomotives running. This is my little Grantline Porter, which is the first thing I built in ON3, and that became sort of the workhorse on these modules, and it's let it lettered for my Mariposa Short Line Railroad. And uh, we had some trees. And as you can see, the guys are credited here on the sign that they put up. Um, we did actually win uh, an award at this um, at this show because they used to give uh, awards for the for the modules. And when uh, Roger Cutter was uh, announcing uh, the awards, uh, uh, the first thing he said about our modules was, we knew we were in trouble when these guys showed up and even the legs were painted. <laughs> so it was, it was a bit of a hoot. Uh, that was... Um, the first year that the module meet was held in Manchester, Maryland, 1986. So after a couple of years of that, we decided to raise a bar and go to two six foot modules. Um, we had enough uh, transportation that we could uh, make that happen. Um, and this featured a longer passing siding and two stub siding, which gave us, uh, sidings, which gave us a little bit more operating possibilities. And it had a scratch built abandoned mill wheel. It was done by uh, Locke McDougall, um, a member at that time of our group. Um, very interesting chap. He was quite a gifted modeler. 
Um, it was still freelanced. It was named Maple Creek Mill after the mill uh, building. And this is also now part of Ted Goodwin's home layout. So here's another one that's uh, that's found new life. Um, and this goes back to the to the mid 80s. So it's uh, amazing these things are still around. We build them strong. <laughs> we didn't build them light. So here's one picture of that module. Um, you can see the little, uh, um, it's a skewed king post uh, bridge that we built here. Now what you can't see, and I can't find a picture of it. I'm pretty sure that is one. I just haven't been able to find it. You might find some, some uh, geese down here. These are snow geese. And the reason we use snow geese is that one of the guys attached to the uh, module meets in those days was a wonderful guy by the name of Ollie Billings. And uh, Ollie was quite a character and he was a bird watcher and he would go to Baffin Island to take pictures of puffins, for example. So he was right, he was right into it. So I put uh, uh, these geese here and they, they have, um, I believe the snow geese have very um, pink feet. And when we showed up with these and Ollie goes over and looks at it and he says, oh, look, the snow geese. <laughs> The other thing you can't see here is it's just, you can just catch a little tiny glimpse of it right here. Um, we used a, a, a running board on the bottom when we were traveling with them. So the nothing on the bottom, like wiring or anything got damaged. And we would take these off and put them back on when we were in transport mode. And somebody got a little bit carried away with a screw gun and they put a hole right through our creek. So there was a screw sticking out through the creek. So we now had a hole. So rather than try to patch it, what we did was we dug it out and we put a rock on it. And I made a turtle to go on the rock. So right in here, there's a turtle. I'll, I'll have to find a photograph of that. Uh, here's the water tank completed. And uh, this is one of the Chooch um, uh, railroad shanties uh, or a lineman shed here uh, at the, he's the, this is the bridge tender effectively. Uh, we had these neat little plastic signs made up that uh, described what, what people were looking at. And, this module behind it is Bill and Mary Miller's Canyon module. And this was an absolute hoot, this module, because this, all of the scenery, this was rock faced on both sides from top to bottom. And it was all plaster. It took four guys, this four foot module took four guys to lift this. <laughs> it was, it was, it must have been over 250 pounds. It was absolutely nuts. Um, but it was, uh, it certainly was great, uh, great visually. So that was 1992 at Kimberton. So that would have been maybe the first or second year at Kimberton. Uh, second year, I believe 91 was the first year. Here's another shot of that module. This is a better picture. Um, facing the other way with a train lined up on a, on a, on a run. And uh, it looks like 278 here in the foreground. And some more equipment. We've got some, uh, some sheep up here, some sheepish characters. So several of the group felt this back and forth thing was getting a bit tedious. So we built a loop and the loop ran behind the 12 foot module and featured a passing siding so that two trains could run. So that made it a lot more interesting in terms of operation. Uh, we also added a lighting system since so many of the halls had inadequate lighting. And uh, after years of showing and running this setup, we sold it and moved on to the final effort. But I want to show you a couple of pictures of this one first. Uh, this is a photograph showing that module. Same water tank, we reused that. Here's the thing with a mill wheel on it right in behind the water tank. Can't really see that very well. It's one of the stub sidings. Uh, as you can see, we now had a painted backdrop. One of our group members, um, Larry, uh, Larry uh, McDonald, is a um, really good uh, backdrop painter, and he did the backdrop painting for us. Um, this was taken with other lights off, so you can see the effect of the lighting that we used. And the one thing we did here, too, is we, we created almost a barrier, like a scene barrier, on the front edge, which is an unusual thing to do. But it gave um, the module some a mystery, but it also gave it some depth. Um, and you can see they added quite a few structures and things in here as we got as we went along with this one. So this got sold um, at Kimberton. And uh, we decided to uh, get more serious. So in 2009, we did a lot of brainstorming. We decided to go all out on the next effort. We wanted to use aluminum frames, which were fabricated by an aeronautic engineer friend to our design. Uh, we wanted to use a modular system for transport to make them easier to transport. Um, we wanted to have, um, it was going to end up approximately at that time, uh, 16 by 38 feet, uh, L-shaped. 
uh, with built-in lighting and permanent structures, and we want a minimal setup time. And of course, the whole thing was designed around reducing the weight. Uh, that was our that was our main concern after having the experience of <laughs> lifting modules up and down stairs and into and out of the back of trucks for so long. So the, for any of you who aren't familiar with that area of Dolores and the RGS, uh, Mancos uh, down this way, and as you can see, Rico up this way, and uh, we're just doing uh, the, the Dolores itself. So to give credit where credit's due, um, I want to um, just show a picture of the Muskrat Ramble in 30 layout, which was introduced at the Australian Narrow Gauge Convention in April of 2009. Now, it just happened that my wife and I were in Australia and New Zealand for a month, uh, the entire month of April that year. And I decided it would be a really great thing for me to go to the convention while we were there. Why not? And who do I run into at the convention, but Jim Vale and Eric Brocker. So I wasn't the only person from North America at the convention. <laughs> there were, there were three of us. So um, it was great because I got to spend, I knew those, both those gentlemen, but I got to spend a fair bit of time with them. Uh, we were in the same hotel and um, it was a terrific convention. Um, I've never had this experience uh, either before or since um, we showed up at the convention. They gave us a driver for the convention. There was a guy who showed up, showed up John, lovely, lovely chap. And uh, he took us anywhere we wanted to go. He took my wife for, for touring around and uh, he took me places and uh, we just had a great time. Uh, terrific, uh, terrific fellow. Very, very hospitable of them to do that. These guys were using um, a very innovative uh, aluminum uh, modular uh, system for their for their structure, for their bench work of their layout, if you want to call it that. Um, now, this was a system that was used commercially for making uh, commercial displays, uh, cabinets and uh, display cases. And when we got back uh, to Canada, uh, we did some searching to find out. We found out that it is available and it's really, really expensive. Um, but we decided we'd use that as a springboard as the idea of making something lighter. The other things we were working on were um, doing something prototypically accurate. Um, so this would be a modular, more correct, a sectional railroad rather than a true modular layout. Since we were building uh, essentially the Dolores yard, it wouldn't make any sense to mix the, 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 the modules up. Um, but the the mainline track was uh, was standardized uh, right through uh, all of the all of the uh, sections. So, uh, with the exception of the corner units and the short unit with the bridge, um, they all had the same setback for the first track uh, from the front. So, um, it, I guess you could argue it was sort of modular. So we're modeling uh, Dolores, <clears throat> 39 to 41 in that era, hand laid code 83 tracks, stub turnouts operated by choke rods, uh, DCC using a wireless NCE system, um, a combination of six foot and four foot modules. Basically the reason for that was designing it also around the vehicles we had available to us and a universal interface design, which I'll go into in detail in a moment. And the corner L was the exception. The corner L we had to treat specially in order to get it to do exactly what we wanted it to do. So that piece was not interchangeable. It was not universal. Uh, that piece had to go together in a specific order. Um, design considerations, we um, as a group uh, purchased uh, an, an MMI C19, which we lettered RGS 41. And we also had a Sunset C16, which belonged to the group which was done as the former Durango switcher, which is number 271. And at this point, well, in 41, it was owned by the lumber company. And I'll have some pictures of that coming up. In terms of rolling stock, it was a combination of the group owned um, AMS grant and San Juan um, models. And then we also had other models that were loaned to the group, uh, loaned to the, uh, to the modules by group members. Um, there wasn't a room for a Y, it was used at the uh, east end of Dolores. Um, so we used a, a, a turntable and we relocated the stock pens towards Mancos to accommodate the Crystal River kit. Now let's take a look at Keith's track plan. So Keith is the one that came up with this plan. He had, he had done a model of uh, Dolores himself in his home layout. So he had all the, the history and the information and the books and all the good stuff. Uh, Harold Midwood also had some great uh, uh, 
technical and historical information on the area. And this is what we ended up with. So coming from the left, um, we had a member from the, from the states, a chap from Pennsylvania, who was interested in having a module on which he could put the Propatria mill model that um, Bill Banta was producing. And this model, this was four by six feet, and that, that model almost filled it. And um, Jim, we lost track of Jim. He came out to a couple of the events. We had this connected to the modules only once, <laughs> and then uh, he vanished, and we lost track of him, and uh, we have no idea what happened. Um, Roger Malinowski had a four-foot module, um, the late Roger Malinowski. The late Dave Nado had a six-foot module, which was the one with the river on it. Then we had the two corner units here and here. They're numbered, they're lettered MLM for the group. Uh, Stan Parsons from our group had the uh, the mill module with the uh, Dolores mill on it. Uh, Don McMurrick in our group had the module just before the uh, the station, and uh, it had the um, station outhouse and the uh, coal uh, coal bin and things like that on it. Uh, my module was the one with the depot on it, and the um, also the uh, the ramp the ramp they had a, they had a coal ramp that went down and they had a gondola there and the, the, the coal was actually hand shoveled into the tenders from the gondola. So uh, that was quite tricky. Um, we had to do some surgery in order to accommodate that on a module. Uh, Keith's layout, uh, Keith's module is the one with the three-way stub on it. Uh, Larry McDonald's uh, module is the next one along. It has some of the interesting uh, yard shed buildings on it. And Art Midwood had the uh, had the last module with a turntable, and we had originally intended to do a cassette, which we never actually planned for, which we never actually uh, uh, finished. Um, just coming back to this module right here, the original idea was that the 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 stock pens were located here in Dolores, and when we got the um, the Crystal River model, we quickly realized there was no way on hell that it was going to fit on there because it almost completely filled a six foot module. So I'll show you some pictures of that later on, but it was worth doing because it's such a spectacular model. So this, this uh, there's way too much information on the slide and probably too hard for you to see. The only thing I really wanna point out here is that this pin is sort of the secret to it all. So if you look at the end view of the modules, it was a C cross section. So here's the floor, here's the back, here's the roof. This is all made out of two by two um, aluminum angle. Um, the bottom and top sections are um, uh, riveted together using gussets. And then the two posts at the corners, which hold up the, uh, the back, um, that they are bolted in uh, top and bottom also using gussets. Um, all of the hardware was um, aircraft quality because the guy who fabricated all this stuff for us uh, owns a business that does um, modifications and certification of aircraft. And uh, he's a friend of mine that I actually met through auto racing. And um, he came up with this pin idea. I knew we wanted something that would uh, align the, the modules carefully. And uh, so he came up with this idea. So let me show you that next slide. Okay, so here's a cross section. This is actually an end view of one of the modules, bottom, back, top. We wanted to travel with these things all assembled and ready to go with the structures in place, the scenery in place, the lighting in place, everything in place, because that would mean that the setup time would be greatly reduced. In order to do that, this had to be a rigid uh, um, assembly that was not gonna, uh, you could take it apart if you had to, but you wouldn't, ha you wouldn't have to normally. Now, um, these were these were all made, all these components were made on a CNC machine. And because of that, we were able to make every, very, very precise uh, holes. So there is a, there are holes here and here and here and here. Uh, they're on one foot six centers. The depth is two feet, the height is two feet. It's, a, it's basically a cube, right? And the standard setback is four inches. And the alignment pins are located here and here. So if you're looking at this end with the back on the right, the alignment pins are top left, bottom right. Now the next unit, they're, they're reversed so that on the next unit, there's a pin that holds into this hole and there's a pin on this end that holds into, goes into this hole. So that means that they are aligned perfectly. The pins were made with for accuracy of plus or minus three one thousandths of an inch. And so 
the accuracy was enough that there wasn't going to be any um, any uh, problem with alignment. And that was one of the things after doing the old method of aligning with modules where you have a little four inch section of track that you have to stick in and you have rail joiners you have to put on, a real pain in the butt, very time consuming and never very satisfactory. This meant that we would have alignment every time, perfect, no fiddling around. Um, the back here, um, now, I will, I'm really glad that, uh, that Jeff talked about foam because we did use foam. Um, we just used a styrofoam as a filler in here. So this is two inches uh, here. So we used, and of course it's an L. So this is uh, come, this folds back. So there's an, there's an L. So I don't have two inches clear. So we used one and a half inch <clears throat> styrofoam, uh, insulation styrofoam. On top of that, we put a sheet of three eighths inch plywood. And the three eighths inch plywood was there for two reasons. One was to make sure that we didn't have the deal deal with the problems that you have when you only have foam, uh, in that it's never completely flat, and it's also uh, an issue with denting it and having problems with it. But the other reason was we wanted to make the entire unit more rigid. Um, a six foot long section with two inch um, uh, angle, you could actually uh, twist that. So if you pick that up from one end, you could actually have a little bit of twist to it. So we wanted to get rid of that. So we used a piece of three inch plywood. We paid a price for that and that was on weight, um, but it also gave us a hell of a lot more rigidity, which I think it was worth doing. It also gave us a nice solid platform to lay track and, and have structures on. Uh, the cork we used was not model railroad cork. Um, I'd had some bad experiences myself with, with the usual model train roadbed cork. Um, we used um, underlay cork, which is used in the in the flooring industry. It's way more dense than model railroad cork. It's better sound deadening, um, and it's available in various thicknesses. We used um, a quarter, a, a nominal quarter inch, at actually five mil. Okay. So we had to put them all together. So what we got, let me go back up again. Uh, what we got from the from the fabricator, um, he sent us the bottoms and the tops. They were all identical because there was nothing in them yet. There was no foam or anything else in them. He sent us all the pins in a bag and he sent us these uh, vertical pieces, which we had to bolt in and we had a big bag of hardware for bolting everything together. So we had to put them all together and they were raw aluminum. So they all had to be stripped with uh, acetone and uh, cleaned and then uh, a little bit of um, sanding to give them a little bit of tooth to them. And then they were all prime painted and then they were all painted black. And then they were assembled. So they were assembled um, at uh, from the components at the Mount Albert scale lumber workshop, which was then located on Al Collins's farm in Mount Albert during the fall of 2009. The modules were then taken to the Tetra Pak warehouse. You may be familiar with the Tetra Pak company. They're the ones that make those uh, little drink boxes with the straw stuck on the side. That's where uh, Keith has spent most of his most of his working life. And uh, they had a warehouse in Newmarket, Ontario, and we took it there for the track work. So Keith told us he was working there at the time, but we're not really sure. I think maybe actually he was spending most of the time working on modules. He was just told other people he was working. Modules were then distributed to their respective owners for scenery, structures, and weathering. So here's the guys at work. This is uh, at the uh, at the uh, new market site. Um, Larry McDonald on the left making up uh, strips of ties using a jig for making up uh, tie strips. Um, we used a jig that has a little bit of space so the ties are not absolutely perfect. This is the RGS after all. Um, and on the right, we have Stan Parsons, who's transferring. Uh, we had one of our group members make up full-size uh, drawings of the uh, of the track plan. I believe Keith actually did that. Um, and uh, here's uh, Stan transferring that information onto the uh, onto the uh, roadbed, so that we've got uh, a correct track alignment. Here's our friend Keith uh, using a, a, a fast tracks fixture for making some making some turnouts. Um, all the turnouts were, were stubs with, I think, the exception of maybe three. It was either two or three that were uh, were point turnouts, but the rest were all stubs because that's what was in Dolores. And on the right-hand side here, you can see our unique method of holding down ties that are just being glued down with these massive lead weights. It, I think it took two guys to handle these things, um, but they did a fantastic job of making sure those, tuck, those suckers were really down because we didn't want anything coming loose on us. Um, You'll notice the ties. You will see some pictures of it later on, but to show the ties, the ties were actually square. And the reason for that is the RGS was not overly generous with its uh, ballast. 
and um, the ends of the ties quite often sh showed and they use square ties. So rather than use the, uh, you know, five by seven or seven by nine profile ties that most people use, we used actually square ties and we custom cut those at the shop and then uh, weather these. We had, we had an interesting way of weathering these, by the way. Um, we did use some some um, uh, Hunterline stains, which I think were available around this time. Uh, but the other thing we did is we uh, we laid them out in the sun. <laughs> Um, we did the, most of this work in the summer, so uh, the, uh, the at least the, the getting the ties ready, and uh, we just laid them out in the sun and uh, um, and cooked them under the under the un, under the hot sun, and they uh, they've weathered beautifully. Here's a couple of pictures showing uh, the frames. I'm afraid these pictures are a little bit dark, but you can see we have a uh, there's a black plastic um, sawhorse, really cheap, twelve bucks sort of item. Um, there's a better picture of that coming up. Uh, this, uh, we call these risers. Um, we wanted the, uh, the layout to be at a height where um, the top, and remember these are two feet high, the top would be level with the head of, a, or just above the head of a six foot person. So you could lean into the layout without actually banging your head or having to wear a crash helmet. Um, so these risers uh, brought the uh, the modules, which are going to sit up here, to the correct height. These were designed and built by our friend uh, Stan Parsons in the group. These are all welded aluminum. Um, and this is the clever part. So even now, if we're talking about 2009, 2010, um, most of the guys in the group are in their 60s. And uh, we don't like crawling around on the floor anymore. So rather than the old uh, T-nut and uh, threaded uh, foot that we used to use at the, in our wooden modules, we have these at, at uh, waist height. So you just basically set a level on the layout and turn this, uh, turn this guy here um, until you get it to the correct level. Uh, this is the uh, layout is the module is sitting on these pins. And um, then after you've done that, you just snug this bolt down and uh, that holds it in place and you're done and uh, move on to the next one. Here's a better shot showing the, the assembled frame. Plastic sawhorse. Uh, whenever they had a sale, at Canadian Tire is a big, a big national um, uh, store chain store in Canada, and they sell household household good tools, uh, uh, automotive stuff, and uh, these things come up for special every once in a while. So we were grabbing those. So here's the risers, and here's the cross braces. The cross braces were funny. We like most people doing this kind of thing. We over designed everything, so we put these cross braces on. We quickly discovered that once the modules are in place. These pins are locked into the bottoms of the modules, right? So these pins right here are locked into the bottoms of the modules. Well, once that's assembled, that's not going anywhere. So you can take off one of these cross braces on each side. You only need one going one way and one going the other way, and you've got it's just as rigid. It won't go anywhere. So uh, that simplified our, our our assembly process. And we also think we discovered the first time we set it all up. Here it is all set up. This is so strong and so rigid. You can actually leave the the risers and everything under out. You, uh, one of the modules is just floating. There's there's nothing underneath it. It's just held in place by the modules on either side of it. So it worked absolutely perfectly. Here's a close up view of that in use. The module is now in place. It's on here. Here's the underside of the module. There's a threaded uh, rod in here with a wing knot on it and that holds on to the drapery track. Uh, when we did drapes, so um, so that's on there, and here's the uh, here's one of the cross braces also held on in place with a butterfly nut or a wing nut. Here's the highly exotic way we had of fastening them together with these uh, jiffy clamps. Um, I, I think the guy that designed these things should have got a Nobel Peace Prize or something. I mean, these things are just amazing. Um, we used them top and bottom. And uh, once they were clamped on, there was really nothing to worry about. Our, uh, the only wiring we had was the bus wire that went from end to end on the backs of the modules that traveled down the back. There was a little groove there that the, the wire was laid in. And uh, any feeders would be picked up off here and then fed in. You can see this is covered up here, uh, right here. And that's a cover. There's a, there's a groove that's been cut in the, in the styrofoam so that we can run the wires and then cover them up. So they're completely safe from any uh, interference. And when we're, in, when we're in travel mode, these are obviously disconnected and there's a slot on the back that fits in that they're, they're tucked into. Uh, we use trailer connectors because they're cheap, they're readily available, and boy, are they rugged. 
<laughs> Apparently you can drive over them. We never actually tested that. We're only using two wires, of course, it's a four wire connector. Okay. Oh, and this uh, shot, this is almost a duplicate shot of that picture. I'm sorry, but uh, this one here shows our, our, our way of keeping uh, off the floor. Uh, we travel with a couple of uh, six foot or seven foot uh, planks that were um, uh, just over a foot wide. And we were able to use those as a shelf for, uh, for all the, the, the boxes where things were, were kept in when we were in show mode. So this is our first reveal in uh, 2010. Um, and we th we had this section done. We had the yard section done. We hadn't done the L. We hadn't done the corner units and we hadn't done around there yet. Um, this is basically year one. Uh, one of the things I want to point out here that on the drawing that Keith had cleverly indicated the streets uh, because they're quite a prominent feature um, and we thought we would be uh, would be bad for us to leave those out. So we, we included the streets uh, on the on the modules in our scenery and um, everything else here is as we originally discussed. So that's good. So here we are at Kimberton. Actually, here we are at Strasburg. So Art Midwood on the left, uh, the late Art Midwood. Uh, Larry McDonald, Don McMurrick, Keith, and myself. Uh, what we used to do is go to Strasbourg on the uh, Thursday night, have a nice dinner, and then on Friday morning we'd run the train, ride the train, and then we'd jump in our cars and uh, drive to Kimberton, which is about an hour and a half away, and then uh, st set up for the modules. And here's our first, our first setup in a in a public location where people could look at us and laugh and point. Um, it's always exciting the first time you do this, right? It's like, uh, hoo -hoo. Um, it works. And uh, here's uh, Don and Stan doing some uh, preparation work, getting the risers installed, getting that all ready. Larry and the group made a wonderful sign for us. So this was based on the sign that was on the end of the station, the Dolores uh, Beat Depot. And uh, he just appeared one day with this thing. It was huge and it was gorgeous. And it was, uh, he had it all framed. It was actually just a piece of styrofoam piece of uh, insulation foam um, and with a frame around the front and he had a box that it fit in and uh, we it became a prominent part of our, our displays. So here's the full arrangement and this is how it ended up. This is uh, this is where we were uh, two or three years later. Um, we had the sec we had this section done the L so uh, we had our, our two corner modules. We had changed um, the the, the the four foot module that was originally going to be Roger Malnowski's ended up going here, and the six foot module that was here that was going to be the river it was put here, and the reason we did that is we discovered that we didn't need the six feet to do the river model, and it made we it meant we had room for that fabulous um, uh, stock pen model, so that went in here, and uh, with the siding, and we also had the ability to do. Um, the, uh, the the creek here. Uh, uh, one of the, a newer member of our group had taken over this module, Brad Mackerick. You'll see a picture of him later. Here's the curve. We also, in this corner, we cove this corner. So the backdrop was actually coved. And then we built a little, uh, a little hill here. I wouldn't call it a mountain. It was just basically a little bit of a rock face and a few, few small trees. So now you've seen the lay of the land and you've seen a little bit of the history of it. Now we're going to take a um, photo tour starting at the stock pen. So we're going to start down at this end right here. And here's our first pictures. The stock pen was a really interesting model because the stock pen, um, we've got track here. This is four inches back from the edge, right? So we are four inches from the edge here. That means we've only got uh, 14 inches left uh, till we hit the uh, the backdrops, the scenery here. So um, the the stock pen wouldn't fit. And this is a really interesting design kit. It comes with a floor for the whole thing, and the floor has been laser cut with all of the posts. So all of these posts have a, a square cutout in the floor piece. And that means that when you put it together, you put it together right. Now we have this problem. We have to take, I think it was two and a half inches, or maybe I have that wrong. It might have been an inch and three quarter out of this out of this uh, depth of this model. So we took one whole fence section out. So what we did is we took the, uh, the we took the floor 
piece that the manufacturer provided and we scanned it. And then I put it in my CAD software and we chopped out the section we needed, relocated all the holes accordingly. And then at fast tracks, we recut a new floor so that the, it was once again, we'd be able to use that same method, which I thought was really clever and that um, we would uh, accommodate our, our shorter model. So this turned out really, really well. As you can see, Pete Walker built this. Uh, he did a beautiful job. He's a terrific model builder, a um, uh, longtime member of our group, uh, now models uh, EBT in ON3. Um, he's also got another model coming up, which we'll see in a little while. Uh, I believe Keith painted the, uh, the uh, horse and, and uh, rider here. Um, and Keith and, uh, and Peter paint, painted the sheep. We also had a little bit of a joke in here. There was a, a story. I don't know how true it was, but um, I was I was once berated by someone for telling it. And they said, oh, it's not true. That's all bullshit. But anyway, um, it's uh, the, the, the story was that the RGS had two goats that belonged to one of the farmers. And the reason they knew it was true was because it actually shows up in some of their ledgers. Uh, some of the financial accounts of the, the the fee they had to pay the farmer for renting the goat. And they used the goat because sheep apparently will follow a goat and a goat's pretty easy to train while, whereas sheep is pretty much impossible to train. So they would, uh, they, they trained the, the goat to lead the sheep into the pen or into the stock car. And then the guy, one of the, one of the hustlers could just reach in and grab the goat and pick him up and haul him out. But <laughs> anyway, it makes for a great story and it makes for a fun model. So here's our, here's our goat. Here's another mo picture of the uh, nice, another nice horseman. These are Aspen horses. Um, very, very nice models. I painted those, Jerry. Yes, sorry. Yeah, I know you did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I just remembered doing it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a while ago. And here's another uh, close up, another one of the uh, Aspen horses. Very nicely detailed with all of the, the water bottle and the blanket on the back and all that stuff. Another long shot of that. We didn't have a lot of trees on the layout. We just had a few small ones like this. They were mostly, uh, I believe they were mostly aspens, the ones we did. And here's another shot of the siding with the uh, Grantline stock car. Okay, the next module is a four footer and that's the one with the beam bridge. Uh, there's two bridges. There's interesting because there's a creek and there's also uh, the river, the Dolores River, and there's a creek that joins the river at this point. So we decided we would model both bridges. And here's the uh, initial phase. Just before completion, you can see that these uh, posts don't have the, they don't have the header board in yet, or the header uh, uh, beam in yet. Um, but it's basically a beam bridge, very simple. Uh, this is built, uh, scratch built by, uh, by Brad Makarik and the group. And here's the larger Dolores River Bridge. Of course, we couldn't get anywhere near the, si near the size of the real thing. And this was also a very simple bridge. It was uh, just basically a, a, a very simple trestle, a number of um, of, uh, uh, of the riser bents rather. And, uh, and it was interesting because there was one that was concrete and the others were wood. So I don't know whether the wooden one got, one of the wood ones got washed out and they replaced it with concrete at some point in this history. I never was able to figure that out. And here's another picture of the uh, of the prospectors or hikers, whatever you want to call them. And here's another picture of the bridge. It was, it was always the pictures we had always showed it was a lot of detritus in the river most of the year. And here's a prospector who's trying his luck. I have no idea if the Dolores River was any good for gold prospecting, but this guy's going to give it a shot regardless. So the next module is the first corner module, and that has the Conoco oil terminal. This was also built by Keith, um, and the figures were by Stan Parsons. Um, the one thing that we changed on this model, is this picture here, you'll see uh, on the original uh, model right in here, I can think you can see the two clamps here. There was a pipe. Um, distribution pipe thing here where trucks could come up and get filled up. We took that off because it was right on the edge of the layout and uh, very susceptible to damage. So we relocated that. Um, but other than that, it's true. The model is true to the, uh, to the um, rags design. This was a rags kit. 
And as you can see, this is the most populated part of all the modules. So it's the, the more figures on here than anywhere. I think uh, I think Stan was having a having a let's paint more paint more figures uh, weekend or something. They have a really nice Alsatian dog model here too. I, I think that's um, Aspen. The next module is um, the other corner module, and this, uh, and I believe Stan did this. I may have that wrong, but I'm pretty sure Stan did this. Th there wasn't a lot going on in this module, so we decided it would be uh, interesting to have a little scenic thing happening. And this is just an abandoned wagon. Uh, yep. like Stan did that, Jerry. Stan put together. Thank you. Stan also uh, built um, uh, the uh, scratch built these uh, structures uh, just uh, west of the uh, mill building in Dolores. There was a uh, there was a uh, uh, this company called Woodard uh, Pumps, uh, which was a uh, um, I guess they were they were uh, serving I would imagine both the lumber mill and also uh, oil. There was oil in this area, so um, and of course people would have uh, pumps for uh, all kinds of uh, water control issues on the river. So. Uh, kind of interesting uh, that uh, uh, Stan was able to come up with that. I want to point out also why we have this shot on. Um, actually, this one's a little bit better. Um, the backdrops. So the uh, what we did is the back of the of the modules. The back piece is another piece of um, one and a half inch thick styrofoam is filled in completely. We wanted something that would be light and rigid and reasonably resistant to, you know, bangs and knocks. So it would be, you know, provide some protection on the back uh, when we were in travel mode. And also um, we wanted something that was good to paint on. So what we did is we put the, uh, the styrofoam on and then we covered it with artist's canvas. So we glued that on and, um, and the glue we used, uh, we sprayed with water and, and used wet uh, white glue and, and stretch that and put weights on them and then left them to dry for a couple of days. And it worked perfectly. We had, I think we only had one that uh, came a little tiny bit loose, but uh, they were very resistant change. And then we had a really nice uh, material to paint on. It was, it was artist canvas basically. So we got together um, at this point, we had moved the Mount Albert business. I, I bought it and moved it to Stony Creek, Ontario. And we were located in a, uh, we had our own build, our own um, uh, unit in an industrial part. And the, we could set up uh, more than half of the modules in a row. So we did that. We organized that. We got a whole bunch of the guys together. Several guys in the group that didn't have modules participated in this. Lex Parker was a member of the group at that time. He came and uh, he, had a, uh, he had a tall uh, stool to sit on. He had a beret on. And uh, he basically told us what to do. So it, it wasn't really painted by Lex. It was painted by all the members of the group. And it was clever the way he did it. Because what he do, he say, okay, now I want you to do this. Take this type of brush. Here's the paints. Do this. Go like this. Go like this. Do like for the grass or do like for the tree or do like this. So we do that for about 10 minutes. And then he'd move us all around. So that it wasn't one person doing one six foot section. It, everybody contributed to that one six foot section. And that meant that the style was blended and we didn't end up with, you know, one unit looking like Al painted it and one unit looking like I painted it and one unit looking like, like Ted painted it. So um, it was a, quite a clever way of doing it. And then the day after it was done, it was all dry. Uh, Lex came back with me and we went along and he, well, he went along. I didn't, I just provided him with tools and paint and stuff, but he went along and just did a little, little bit of touch-ups. He added some, some uh, birds flying in the sky and a few other things uh, just to make it a little bit more beautiful. So it worked out really, really well. Uh, Stan also did a, this neat truck for the wooded pumps. And here's the guy with the truck blocking the track, which is sure is going to be a real problem. You can see there's a seam here because the, the seams in the in the backdrop are almost impossible to completely hide. Um, but the seams on the ground were in between the modules were pretty good. Um, usually what we did at the shows, we take a little bit of ballast material and some sand and we just sprinkle it along here. And then at the end of the show, we'd pull them apart and it would fall down to the ground and we'd sweep it up and... Uh, get solve it that way. Uh, the building on the right coming up on the next slide is the Dolores Mill building, which was also built by Stan Parsons. Um, now this is this is an interesting building because it's um, we get it from photographs um, or Stan did it from photographs. It's it's almost completely covered in corrugated metal, 
and uh, I can't remember. I think he used solders, uh, real uh, metal, not the uh, not the mylar version that uh, Roger was producing. I think this was real metal, and um, and this building was permanently in place. It wasn't. Uh, we didn't have to remove that. The um, uh, he did a thing here too. There's a one section here where the door open. You can see there's a door open here. There's a guy standing in the doorway here. Uh, it's kind of a fun little detail. It turned out quite well. All kinds of regular rolling stock. You've seen a few things, uh, tank cars we have. And uh, this is um, this is a car that was donated by one of our members, uh, the late Stan Windrum. And um, this was a Tamalco car. And if anybody's ever built one of these, it's essentially like scratch building because basically you get a little box with a bunch of sticks in it and some drawings. Um, it, they're really quite complicated kits to build and uh, Stan made a specialty of building Tamalco cars and he just did a beautiful job. Did them all. He did, uh, did box cars, reefers, stock cars, the whole nine yards. Uh, some people may remember Bill and Mary Miller, and this was uh, this is Bill Miller's donation to our uh, to our modules. Nice little uh, nice little Ford uh, pickup with a bunch of junk in the back. And there's a seam right here. That's a seam right here. The Goose House, which was located behind the depot in uh, Dolores, uh, was uh, this was a scratch built by Don McMurray. We didn't have room for the whole thing, so we had to do it at a slight angle. And then the one corner of the building was cut off so it would fit. But the Goose would actually fit inside. So, uh, so uh, these doors operated. They were they uh, they were they were pinned from here, um, and. Uh, they actually interesting that they survived all the travels that they did, and I, I think they only came off a couple of times. Uh, this is the goose fuel shed that was put at the end of the Dolores uh, Depot platform. Uh, it had a gas pump inside for fueling the geese. And actually, it, it's, it's unfortunate this picture is shown with the door open, door closed. The door was open, the door opened, and uh, there, was a, uh, there was a gas pump inside. Um, and here's this truck. Um, we're going to come back to this truck in a minute, but uh, this is the truck that Peter built uh, that was an RGS lettered vehicle. Um, and this is the uh, depot that was built by Peter Walker. Beautiful job. You can see in this shot also, you can see the, the ramp here that was used for coaling. Here's another shot. This is number 41 coming into the uh, Dolores Depot. One of the things you may notice here, you'll see the square ends on the ties. Uh, if you look really closely, you'll see that there's four spikes in every tie. This was done with a Katie Spiker. Go all the way along. Lots and lots and lots of spikes. Uh, the uh, these these uh, nice folks here think this guy is taking a picture of them. He's actually a real nerd, and he's taking a picture of number forty-one. One of the things that Peter does with his buildings, he does nice things with blinds in the windows and open windows, that kind of thing. Makes a big difference. Here's number 271 down in the uh, in the coaling pocket. Um, you may wonder why that what this is about. Um, after they sold 271, uh, after DNRGW sold it to the uh, McPhee Lumber Company, um, actually, I think it was it had a different name by then. But uh, anyway, it was a lumber company uh, that was at McPhee, um, west of town. Uh, all they did was they just painted out the DNRGW logo and the DNRGW uh, um, name on the side of the tender. And uh, so there's pictures of it looking just like this. And also being the Dolores switcher, it had this really interesting uh, toolbox sitting on the roof. I think it became Montezuma Lumber Company, Jerry. Uh, Mon I think it was Montezuma or something yeah, like that. Yeah, Montezuma. So here's the uh, here's 271. Now, now Art uh, um, really just once once DCC came into place, Art really discovered uh, putting lights in all his all his all his locomotives. His dad Harold was never very keen on that, but Art loved it. So this locomotive you can see in this photo, it's got the firebox light happening, and it's got a light in the cab as well. Nice little model. Huh? Here's uh, visiting a locomotive as uh, number 74. Uh, the guys were welcome to, uh, invited to bring any RGS lettered equipment um, when we were having an open house or if we were on tour somewhere. 
and there was always unusual visiting equipment. Now, some of you may know what this is. Um, Baldwin, um, DNRGW approached Baldwin about building an articulated for them um, for, I guess, the, for the, uh, the fall stock runs and for the um, uh, tank, tr tank car trains. And they needed something with more power. And they came up with a design and they did the drawings, but they never actually built it. But the drawings are available. So Art got a uh, copy of the drawings and he scratch built this locomotive. I believe he started, if I'm not mistaken, with two brass K36s and uh, worked from there. And uh, it's just a magnificent piece of equipment. It's so huge because especially if you're used to most narrow gauge locomotives, you look at this thing and it's just ginormous. Um, then uh, one of the reasons they never built it probably because they wouldn't have anywhere where they could turn it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was a it was a monster. Uh, that is now in uh, Ernie Albright's collection, I believe. Let's get back to this truck. So this was usually uh, located um, as shown before beside the depot because we knew it was there at least once in its life. And here's a picture of it before it got its, uh, this is before it got its rear view mirrors or its, its lettering on the side. This is when we first saw it. Uh, Peter Scratch built this. Um, I believe he started with a, with a die cast uh, with, had the cab and the body uh, and, the, and the hood, uh, but this all had to be scratch built. And here's the picture. Um, I hope you can make this out in the top left here. Here's the picture showing the real thing. This is about 41, uh, 1941. This is the Dolores Depot. Um, these two characters here are standing around doing not very much of anything. Um, but that's what we started with. And uh, Peter made this model from that photograph. Uh, it's got the correct wheels on it. Uh, it's got this thing that we never did figure out what it was because it's not a gas tank or a water tank because there's no cap on the top. Um, it's got a what looks like a toolbox type of latch on the front here. Um, we couldn't figure out if it was a toolbox, why they just didn't put it inside. But anyway, it's got a bracket and holds it up. And uh, Pete had to figure out how to do the lettering by that time. So it was uh, a lettered RGS. And it had the long stock um, rear view mirror so you could see around the, uh, around the uh, trailer part. Um, that made it quite difficult to transport, <laughs> but <laughs> we managed to do it without breaking them off. Moving along past the depot, here's the, uh, this is uh, Keith's uh, um, module. Um, here's the three-way stub switch. Uh, this is the only turnout that we actually purchased. Uh, this one was, um, I can't remember who made that, but um, uh, it was, it was a three-way. So we decided that uh, to expedite things, we would actually buy one and it was actually perfect. It was, we had no trouble with it at all. Uh, we used a device that um, uh, GME, uh, Randy Lee, I think his name was, um, came up with a um, device to operate this with a three-way switch. And uh, this worked perfectly. It was just a great thing. And here's the uh, signs here by uh, Bill Miller did those for us. And um, Jimmy Culture in our group um, from photographs built these sheds, which were in the yard at Dolores. Here's a grocery store that Larry McDonald in the group uh, had this on his module. We didn't have a picture of, of this, of what was actually there. So we, we, we uh, improvised. This shed was, uh, was accurate from the photographs. Water tank, uh, this was a resin uh, uh, structure that uh, Art Mib would weathered up uh, to match photos of the uh, Dolores tank. And here's the turntable that was a last minute addition, last addition. So uh, Art originally uh, uh, built this and it was just simply functional. It wasn't particularly uh, um, scenic. And then uh, Brad came back in and did a lot of uh, work to it to make it more attractive. Okay, so that ends our, our photo tour. Now I'm going to um, show you what happens when we had this thing on tour. So this is uh, uh, September, 2018. Minneapolis National Ga Narrow Gauge Convention, uh, 48th, sorry, 38th. And uh, here we are um, unloading the trailer. This is Chris Zygmunt's trailer. Chris has a, has a construction business and um, 
does uh, home rent renovations and various other things. And he's an honorary member of our group by virtue of the fact that he's a friend of Keith's and also because he loaned us not only the trailer, but also the truck to pull it with <laughs> and him as a driver. So all of the modules fit in this. The only things that were uh, not in the truck were the, um, the, uh, the sound system and uh, the locomotives and cars. Um, everything else was, uh, we managed to squeeze into this trailer. And you can see a couple of the guys uh, getting the uh, units out. It was it was wide enough that we could actually put them in crosswise, which is, which is great. And here they are uh, helping uh, getting onto the loading dock. Um, these guys were great. The Minneapolis guys were just terrific because uh, it was the only convention I've been at where, almost the only convention I've been at where I've had um, volunteers who were helping us move stuff. It was just terrific. It was quite a lot to do and uh, they were very helpful. So here it is going together. Now, this is the only real good shot I've got of it showing how they traveled. So there's two modules here. There's a module here that's, the, the, here's the open face of it. So the back is down here, the floor is here. And the second module is here. So it slides underneath this and it's the back is here. And we have end gables and they fit into the pins that are on the ends of the modules. And then there's holes where we put um, three eighths inch uh, bolts through uh, to hold the, the modules in position with these uh, units face to face. Now, the reason they're face to face is you can, it's really hard to damage them. So the, um, uh, the back here, if someone happens to knock this or bang it or kick it, it's not a problem because it's two inch styrofoam. It's solidly held in place and it's got an aluminum frame all the way around it. So it's pretty rigid. You can see the top. The top is a piece of coroplast, eighth inch coroplast, very, very light, uh, but fairly rigid and completely white. So that's what we needed for a ceiling to re reflect the light. Um, there are tabs on the top here, which hold that from, prevent it from sagging down. Um, and here are two of the guys. Here's, uh, here's Stan, uh, here's Brad Mackerick. That's me. And this is Viv Reynolds with his back towards us here. Um, in the dismantling stage. You can see we've already got a couple of the modules up on the risers and ready to go. Here's the guys, uh, here's the aluminum supports here. The guys are putting those up, getting them in place. Brad here is going along and uh, fastening clamps in and doing the wiring for the lights. There's a jumper that has to be connected. And here's the only picture we have of Pete, Pete Walker. I think Pete is somewhat camera shy, so we only have the one picture of him. Jeff Millman is over here in the background. And this is Dave Pennington, our group, who's uh, um, who was uh, helpful at the uh, on the shows. All the guys who were from our group who were coming to any of the conventions were great, uh, uh, volunteering their time to uh, you know man the man the station, answer questions, do whatever. This is the this is the box with the sign in it. And here's some over here with a wrapped up in an old bed sheet or uh, some of the uh, cross braces. You, you could have seen the uh, two modules uh, nested together in that picture as well, Jerry. It gives a pretty good view of it. Yeah, there's the there's the two modules. As you can see, the end uh, panel has uh, holes in it for hand holes for, for lifting. Uh, a six-foot a six module with a track and the scenery on it weighed 36 pounds. So two of these together was, and with the uh, end gables, and uh, you're pushing 100 pounds. So it was, uh, you know, it wasn't, wasn't exactly lightweight, um, but if we were to do it again, we'd probably find a way of making it even lighter. So here's Brad uh, working on a turntable and stand in the background. What I wanted to point out here is the lighting. I don't have a, a photograph of this because uh, lighting designers don't usually take pictures of their lighting. They usually take pictures of the effect of their lighting. Um, this was uh, 2010 when we did this. Um, so in 2010, there really wasn't any LED, appropriate LED um, fixture available that would give us a uh, good color um, and, and reliability. In the early days, LED stuff was pretty unreliable uh, and much better today. Uh, today, we would probably use the same idea, but with, um, with LED uh, type fixtures. Um, these are uh, T5 fluorescent, which are the small diameter fluorescents, and they're held in place with metal clips that are bolted through the uh, aluminum uh, um, top of the roof here. And uh, the only wiring really is there's a jumper wire that goes from the end of each unit over the roof and then back into the uh, uh, next unit. So that's the only uh, thing that has to be hooked up. 
Hey, Jerry, we're just over an hour into this particular presentation, so I think we can yep. do it. I'm just about finished. Uh, I got about uh, 10 or 12 more slides. So here we go. Um, last touches. I, we always carried a few extras of these um, of these uh, saw horses because they came in handy for resting stuff on and that kind of thing. Almost ready. Putting some final touches on. It's, uh, you, you can see in this shot, we've actually got the equipment on and the sign is up and ready to go. Uh, these were all taken at Minneapolis. And it's gone. So uh, not long after that, we sold these. Uh, they went off to um, the States. And uh, here it is uh, with, uh, I believe it's Jeff here is uh, helping load these puppies into the trailer. And I don't believe the don't believe them when they say this is not 15 feet. It's only 15 feet at the top. It's not 15 feet on the floor. So, <laughs> so the modules and rolling stock were sold to Jack Walton in 2021. Jack had intended to install the modules in his new home near Bayfield, Colorado, but had to change his plans. So the modules are now waiting to be moved into a new space in Texas. And our, our spy in Texas, uh, Mr. Lachey, is going to keep keep an eye on that. Uh, so uh, Dolores will live again. We won a number of awards. We won several awards uh, with our earlier modules, um, but Dolores won in 2012 and 2013 at the Ontario Narrow Gauge Show and at 2014, 16, 17, and 18 at uh, various Narrow Gauge conventions. Uh, we had, um, the rule was that you couldn't enter a con uh, in a contest if you had won first place, but when we won the best module in Kansas, we didn't have the whole thing. We only had the yard section. So when we entered in Minneapolis, we entered the yard section was not part of the contest. It was the L and the stock pens and all that that was part of the contest. Oh, by the way, I forgot to point out the stock pen and the river both had sound effects. And here's just a couple of shots from shows. Here's one from Kimberton showing the yard section up uh, Art Midwood in the background there. Here's the guys in uh, Hickory uh, enjoying a, winning, a, winning a prize. Uh, chap on the far right hasn't been any of the pictures before. It's Dave Maneri, that's uh, formerly in our group. Uh, once again, uh, one Ontario Narrow Gauge show. Uh, this is Jimmy Culture who built those, uh, built those structures. And here we are again with another win at the Ontario Narrow Gauge Show. Uh, Toronto Train Show, fall of 2016. This, this thing was really impressive in space because first of all, the lighting was great. And so you could really see it no matter where you were, it stood out and it was big. So it, you know, it really got people's attention and it was kind of neat because it was filled in. We also made a point after being in a show where we had this situation where we were out in the middle, we painted all the backs. So the back all looked finished too. And there was a, one of our logos on the, on the back of each module. Also on the back of each module was a Canada customs tag. So we could actually get back into the country. <laughs> uh, Minneapolis, uh, happy award winners. Uh, the only piece you have people you don't hear now, Pete Watson is not in our group, but he's a local modeler in this area in the Niagara area. Uh, half inch scale modeler, narrow gauge, uh, really ex excellent modeler. And this chap here is from Peterborough, Ontario, not in our group, uh, Jim Birchall, prolific uh, modeler and uh, won several prizes at the Minneapolis. So one of the reasons we do all this is is because of the people, right? And um, so part of the, the, the joy of this and, and, and the sadness is that the people come and go. So um, Harold and his son, Art, and of course, Harold's wife, Virginia, have all left us. Um, Harold was responsible for getting us started. He introdu introduced us to the Mid-Atlantic Narrow Gauge guys, and he and Virginia provided transport and moral support in the early days. They always they had a, an Argosy trailer, so they always had cold beer and warm blankets and all the coffee that, you know, the rest of us were traveling around with and we didn't have. Uh, Art continued in his dad's tradition and hosted many work sessions at his home in East Toronto and also Alex Northway and Stan Windrum who participated with the early modules and they also have passed on. So the, the friendships that we made over the years in doing these things over the you know 
almost 40 years that we did modules and the more than 40 years that the group's been together um, have been great. And I just want to point out some people who helped Dave Burrows. He, he modified slide switches to act as turnout machines for us. Um, a very inexpensive way of solving the, a problem and uh, dead reliable. Um, Al provided his well-equipped shop for the construction process and a lot of moral support and vehicles for hauling stuff and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, uh, Al has a huge Bridgeport mill in his in his uh, in his car shop, and uh, is, there's not too much he can't fix or 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 or, uh, or repair, or rather create. Uh, Jim Culture, I pointed out, John, Don McMurray did the Goose House. Uh, Lex Parker supervised our backdrop painting. Stan Parsons did the Dolores Mill and most of the figures. Uh, Keith built most of the turnouts, arranged for us to use to Tetra Pak Warehouse, which was a godsend. Peter Walker, various structures. And all the rest of the guys in the group who always provided support at events. You didn't mention yourself, Jerry. <laughs> you yeah, right. were instrumental in a lot of what went on and you coordinated most of the events and made sure that the paperwork was right to get these things across the border. So yeah, that I was give you fun, credit too part. for all the hard work you did, my friend. Thank you. Yeah, it was... Um... It was fun. That was great. You know, and the, the nice thing about this, and as Jeff pointed out in his presentation, you learn as you go, right? So when you're doing these things, you learn by your mistakes. You learn, you know, how to do better job on track work, how to solve that problem <clears throat> with modules and how they join together and what happens at the join and how do you can make sure your track's aligned. Um, you know, all those things. Um, one of the things we did, I should mention at the, at the track joins is the the last four ties on each side are copper and those rails are soldered they're not spiked um and that gave us more even more reliability in those uh those situations i don't think i think it was one exception but i i, I think um there was one time when we had a problem with one join but other than that we never had it they were just you put them together and, the, and you and you run the trains it wasn't any fiddling around with the with the corners there are a few comments and questions, Jerry. Um, yeah. yeah, I said I like the idea of having scenery along the front edge um, to create like a view block in front and a, that had a couple of lights. So I think that was a great idea. Um, quite a few people and like got involved in discussion about goats leading sheep. Uh, Sid <laughs> says they were called a scapegoat and um, yeah. Um, Bill Hobbs said they were called a Judas goat because they use those yeah. goats at the slaughterhouse to lead the sheep to slaughter. I'll think of that when I have my lamb tonight. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and oh, it keeps moving in front of me. Uh, Jim said, great, uh, inspiring presentation. Thanks for sharing with us. That's Jim Brown in, up in Vancouver, another Canadian. Um, and Mike was talking, I think, about that white truck with the weird little box on top. Yep. He was saying that was after they discontinued the Durango Dolores Goose. They transported the mail in it, so the box had to stay locked. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a good piece of information. That. That's what it was for. Yep. Wow. Um, uh, Chuck Proudfoot wants to say, hey, after all of this, how about a, a presentation on the mud hands layout? So that would be great, Chuck. Um, <laughs> and yeah, Mike Hart, Mark Evans says, great modeling and presentations. Thank you. And Gavin Hall says, amazing sharing. Thank you so much for the stories. Very inspiring. And hello from Singapore. So there you go. Wow. So, well, thank, thank you, Jerry. 